So, uh, hi everybody, my name is Kelly Rapaz. I am a mentor with uh, FLL team 57674. Um, we're relatively new to this. We This is our second year in first. I know, I'll introduce um, myself real quick. To be, to be, I'm gonna be your hype person. Okay, first. fine. So, um, the last session was all about hyping the other person. So, uh, my husband here, uh, Dave, is Dr. David Huss. He is the Director of Neurological Services at the Neurodevelopmental Center at West Virginia University, and he's also a um, clinician and um, an applied researcher at the Rockefeller Neurosciences Institute at West Virginia University. Um, so the idea for this talk really came out of our experience. Um, like a lot of people who first did their toes in first, a kid brought us here. Um, particularly this one right here, this is our oldest Julian. Um, this is our middle child, Petra. She also was on our FLL team this year. Um, neurodivergent kids are just wired a little different. Back when we were young, we would just say, hey, that person, that person's brain is just wired a little differently. And that's essentially what it is. Um, we think a lot about difficulties. Um, the ones that we all think of, the ones associated with ADHD, but it kind of cuts across all neurodivergences. Um, so Julian has ADHD, I have ADHD. Um, Petra has ADHD as well. She also has uh, apraxia and a language, a language and communication disorder. So um, it makes particularly the, the uh, non-technical side of her, the communication side, a challenge for us. Um, in terms of what we see with neurodivergent people in general, a lot of folks have a lot of experience with people who are impulsive, they have trouble with working memory. Set shifting, this is actually a relatively new term for a very old problem. It is when a person is so focused on a task that when it's time to shift to the next thing, the person is not equipped to do so. Um, they're not ready to do so. I'm building the robot. This is what I'm doing right now. Why are you asking me about an innovation project? That is that is a difficulty with, with uh, set shifting. Um, uh, also, when we're looking at the interpersonal aspects of first, we see a lot of relationship management and emotional regulation concerns, as well as networking concerns, particularly when you get into FTC and FRC, when you're being asked to communicate with people you don't know and collaborate and develop approaches together. Next one. Okay. Um, that said, this was an excellent opportunity for our kids to grow. Um, FLL is great for neurodiverse learners in the sense that it encourages strengths and interests kids already have. Um, we came to FLL because we had a kid who was interested in robotics and loved Lego. Um, also, there's places where the student can um, bring in their outside lives into the team. Uh, this past year, uh, the shared interest that our teammates had found was actually outdoors and geocaching. And so, um, and so it was really great to see these kids who are generally pretty analog um, start to think about how, and their project was about accessibility um, with geocaching. So thinking about how someone who may not be able to experience the world the same way you do can experience the activities like you can. Um, some of the best things about FIRST is clear goals and objectives and regular opportunities to practice communication. Um, every single practice is a practice where we're practicing communication, honestly. Um, because, so everything from, you know, while they're working, tell me about your robot. What are you building here? What is, um, what are you trying to, what are you trying to work toward? What mission model are you working on? There's also really great opportunities for reflection and self-assessment, which is something that is difficult for neurodivergent brains, but is very, very necessary as well. Um, challenges, and these are all good things. Um, a lot of times we tend to think of challenges as something that is that makes an experience worse. For us, these are actually kind of value adds. Um, so um, the biggest challenges we have had in our limited experience with this are probably these points for, what is that, four and five? Yeah. So, so, um, so particularly with, 
um, neurodivergent thinkers who have very black and white sort of thinking processes, who see things in binary, who um, kind of see things like that. The subjective parts of the assessment in FLL, probably less so in FPC or FRC, um, we're about to learn that, um, they're confusing and in some ways they're a reason for disengagement. Um, so we have one person on our team every year, the only thing this person cares about is winning the robot game <laughs> because that is what makes sense to them. That is what they can wrap their heads around. They have a manual that tells them how many points can be scored for doing what sorts of things. That's something they can understand. Um, when you look at the rubrics for even robot design and um, the innovation project, the standards are not that black and white. They're not clear cut. And from a mentor standpoint, it kind of puts us in a weird position because we're trying to figure out how to describe the value in a way that somebody says, well, but I know if I get the most points here, I will have met a goal that I have, that I have for myself. Um, so really trying to broaden the perspective and horizons on what you want to get out of FLL can sometimes be a challenge. Um, and Kelly, you missed before the talk before this, the guy was talking about doing better worksheets for the notebook. You know, so yes. Yeah. yeah so, so that's that. and that's and that's that's another thing is yeah. and that goes back to the communication skills. Um, communication is not just coming up and giving a talk or presenting to a panel of judges. Communication is also documenting your work, making sure the next person understands what you did. All of those sort of things, um, when you have a person that lives in their mind so much, um, as a lot of neurodivergent people do, that really becomes a difficulty. Um, so I think this is our, so what we've learned, um, Interest-driven, um, very, very interest-driven learners um, to the point that sometimes it is hard to move towards something that they don't understand completely. Um, also, this is a huge one for robot design for us, the idea of a top-down thinker versus a bottom-up thinker. So when we're talking about a top-down thinker, this is a person that looks at this robot and says, well, Sorry, dude. It has a gyro active. Ah, okay, that, that explains it. Um, it says, what does this do? Or what are the capabilities? What can I get these technic pieces and this part to do, right? And so a top-down thinker is going to go on YouTube and look at solutions from past years to see what the capabilities of the robot are. Um, then they're going to come back and they're going to be like, I have no idea how to build a gearbox. I don't know how these attachments you know, dot, dot put on things like that. And they're gonna go at it from that process. A bottom up thinker is going to get a spike hub and motors and be like, how does the motor make the thing work? And then they're gonna go at it kind of more from like, like how is this thing operating inside? And then how do I add to it to make things work? Um, we have a bit of both in the past on our teams. And so what we're really trying to do is find a way for students to meet in the middle to see what we're okay. looking for in robot design and what we're looking for um, in, in solving the problem. The other thing, clear instructions and task definition. <laughs> you can't be like, okay, let's go work on, let's go work on mission models. Nothing will happen. You're gonna be, you have to say, okay, so, Let's try to score 45 points today. What are some of the ways we can score 45 points? Let's look at the mission models that we can use. Can we link these together? Can we build from there? Highly structured work environments and well scaffolded approaches to project management. Um, I guess in a prior session, we were talking about building a better worksheet. My kingdom for better worksheets. Yeah. Um, this is actually, that's actually the biggest growing edge that we see for ourselves and how we are developing a learning process for our students. Um, and this all goes to the role of a mentor. Um, now, this, this idea from 1998, like being human-centered, evolved a bit. 
But the important part of this is that we see the role of the mentor as the person, the intermediary that can get what is in the kid's head out of their head and into reality. And um, so we are the people that they can actually meet, they can emulate, they can look at the process. We're always modeling the process. Um, and you have to be, you, we have to ourselves be really good at what we do so they can understand what the possibilities are. Um, so the way that we actually define mentors in our space is that a mentor is someone who inspires students and scaffolds learning opportunities to build excitement, momentum, teamwork, and learning through the challenges. So how do we do that? We build a toolbox, and this is where we're going to switch places. Because, okay. <laughs> um, so one of the, I don't know, we'll go through, so one of the kind of innovations we came up with as a team. So, so first, oh, we're, so first we'll say, so we, we kind of have five or six areas that we saw as being places where we can make the process more accessible to neurodivergent learners and more hands-on and kinetic. Um, we kind of came from this environment where we were, where people were planning first and then building. And that doesn't necessarily work so well with someone who just wants to be able to flip the switch and get it to go. Um, so we saw robot design, programming, um, having technical tools, which kind of goes into design and programming, and then um, practice design and documentation. And that's that's kind of the scaffolding side of it. So robot design. Yeah, so one of the problems with very community teams don't have a ton of money and can't buy a bunch of spike kits. So one of the first things we, we had this problem is how do we make it so everyone can touch a robot as much as possible. One, one solution we came up with this again does not use the default Lego system. It's something called five bricks, but with five bricks, you can put it in any Lego hub. So what we did is we went online. You can buy these Technic hubs. They're fifteen dollars. You can go on. You can go on Bricklink. You can buy large angular motors that are the Technic ones, power up ones. They're fifteen dollars each. So this robot here is about hundred bucks, and we built copies of our robot. The only difference between this robot and this robot, the hubs are slightly different size, but you see, I have to do some engineering to make them work. The only difference is this one has light sensors. This one doesn't. Okay, this one's only 100 bucks. This is probably about five, six hundred dollars right here. Um, so we we had the ability. So one of the things we came up with was a method to make kind of these mock bots that are more remote controlled, so that the kids can try out attachments on the modular system, design them in real time with remote control. But actually, if I go here real quick, I can. And this one, I think, pair to a. Like and yeah. it's important to note that the modular design piece of it. Um, there's a lot of free modules. There's a lot of free ones available. The, the, the Lego ADD would work well. You know, you can. You know, um, Droidbot E. Um, Droidbot E design. Droidbot E was a was a big inspiration you can, for you us. Can then have a, if you have a module robot designed with Droidbot E or or the you know Lego's advanced driving days, you can make some. Mock robots and having kids solve mission models in real time, hands on them. Um, some RC code there. You can have that when they do one of these things. Um, move on to the next one. It's it, it's also really great when you have kids that can't set shift because you yeah, can you say, just leave them with the little robots. You know, well, you keep doing that, and we'll move on to, to something else. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're not monopolizing uh, the robot for that. And for kids that aren't quite sure about the coding yet, they can do this without having any real coding knowledge and they can develop that. And then they case. can learn you know, how to code. What we want them all to learn how to code, but you know, we don't want anyone to get discouraged if they don't know how to code right now. So, uh, but to do this, we have to something called Hybrix, which is a third party firm where you have to put on the, the hubs. Um, it, it, like again, the same flashes on these sort of hubs, flashes on the regular spike hubs. Um, the only disadvantage about Hybrix is depending on which way you're doing it, you're doing it in, in Python, text-based Python coding, it is 100% free. If you're doing it in the block interface, which will show in a minute, you have to buy a license. It's fifty dollars per license, or you can buy like a season-wide license with as many seats as you want for a hundred. That's like works for a year, or you can buy a school-wide license for that's good forever for as many seats as you need for a whole school. That's six hundred. The bit, bit price, um, but you can get a single single seat single license for fifty. Bucks. It's it's not too bad. But if you're using the text base, it's completely free. It's only if you want to do that. The block interface, which we'll pull up here in a minute. So this is kind of what actually it looks like here. And what's cool about it is you do the blocks, and this is just some code commented to make it drive in a triangle, essentially. And um, 
you know, it, 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 you can close this tab if you want, but it shows in the block what it would actually look like with the Python. So it's there. So you can code in both Python or the block interface. So you can actually code in, you can have you can have separate files open. So you can have a separate file with some text-based code in. You can actually import that code as a block into your block-based interface if you want. But uh for example, I think that's the number. This has been really useful. So last year we had uh a team range in age from 13 to seven. Yeah, we had seven. <laughs> and she was able to, the dyslexic seven year old help out. She was able to still uh, manage it. So we can go, to, that's just an example where it would drive forward in the triangle. Uh, the other advantage of uh, Ibrix too over the Lego software, it actually has built in gyrotrain. And you also, you give your robot the dimensions, so you give it the wheels, you give it the wheel spacing, it does all the math for the geometry. So rather than, program, you can program things in pretty much basic English, like drive forward 141 millimeters, turn 33.3 degrees. You can even tell it to drive in a arc of 33.7 degrees in a radius of 227 millimeters. Okay. So, it, it's it's it, all, all built in, you don't have to touch it. But this, this turns on the gyro first, drives forward with me. Triangle turns it off. So we found when we were using the regular Lego software, kids were getting lost in the weeds. Yeah, they're getting lost. <laughs> Wheel so, turns and, 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 and these little things they had to do. So we can go to the next one. So yeah, the big part is the remote control. Um, it's not just remote control. This one's this one we actually they just added code to what Xbox controllers do. It's a little faster. We probably slow it. I think my kids are doing battle boxes. A little faster, but um, you know you can control the. The thing, but the other cool part about it is it has code. So when you push the button, if this was hooked up to the computer, every time you push the button, it tells you how far the robot is, how far it turns. Um, it'll tell you how far the attachment is, for example. So it, you can go through and it comes up like if you were using the tie breaks. Yeah, so right here, it would print off to the council, something like this. And then you can just take these numbers, the kids can just take these numbers and use them for programming. Mm -hmm. So they can drive the robot around the board. Take measurements using the robot by using the game button controller, and then you know take this 127 and do a drive base, uh, and do like a drive base, you know, straight 127 robot will do that. Oh, and the other thing, the other really great. Oh, yeah, we're just taking some other tools that they can um, like to use. The, so my oldest is a huge fan of serials calculators. Um, these are great because it takes. The Lego system, and then um, gives you gear ratios, pulley ratios. There's a chart of wheels, so you can look at all of the different wheel types. You can get their diameters, you can get their dimensions, and then easily convert that into what you need for um, for your builds. Um, I'm actually kind of excited. Uh, I haven't used the mock manager yet, but I think the mock manager is actually going to be a really useful uh, tool for us to keep track of. The engineering design process with the mock bots. So, um, so yeah, it's a it's a great resource developed by some dude in Poland. <laughs> okay, structure. You're gonna talk about this part. Yes. Okay, so structure is one of the hardest things. Um, in an earlier session today about community based teams, which we are a community based team, um, we talked about the challenge of having. Um, Families have enough buy-in and not treating it as a kind of child care service. Um, one of the things that we really need to do is um, we have to learn how to manage two different things with ADHD brains. So with neurodivergent brains, we have to learn how to manage time, which is an illusion to a lot of us. And then you don't have to we have to know how to manage stuff, which is hard for us to keep track of. So um, the first thing if you can do is to structure expectations and communicate those expectations as clearly as possible, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, this is things like having standards of behavior in place, um, having predictable, equitable, and um, restorative consequences when things happen and things will happen. It's also letting students know what they can work, what they're going to work on ahead of time, so they can mentally prepare for it. Um, neurodivergent people hate surprises. A lot of us. Um, 
And the last thing you want to do is spring something on someone that they weren't um, mentally or physically prepared to do. Um, also, having a visual board of what the whole season looks like and where you are in the season is absolutely Very crucial. Um, that's something that we were really hoping to do this past year, but then our season was kind of compressed, and so we didn't get a chance to. Another thing, when you're talking about hard, uh, people who have difficulty set shifting, time checks. So what you're doing in a time check, you're not, not just telling the person how much time they have left. You're also giving them an opportunity to mentally prepare to change tasks. Um, so we usually do 10, five, two minute warnings. Um, there are also, I don't know if you've seen them, there are these products called time timers. So these are like basically egg timer sort of things that are like wall clock size. And you wrap them up to 60 minutes and it's a shaded circle that then dwindles. Um, that has been the most effective way for us, for a kid to see how much time is left that we've found. Um, also front loading the harder tasks. Um, if you've got a team that really loves working on the robot, you may want to start with innovation project during a project session or do a couple innovation project sessions before you even get into playing with the mission models. Or let them play with the robot at the very end. So yes. Or have that, be the, have that be the reward at the end, yeah. um, which I don't like using the word reward like that. It's more of, you know, kind of a decompressed time. But um so inclusion, how other how we can make a more inclusive environment. And this is a place where we've seen a lot of a lot of discussion over the past couple of years, I think. Um, in our in our area, we are in West Virginia, we actually have a quiet room um, in our FLL tournament, which is absolutely necessary because of the space it's in. Um, first competitions are vibrant, they're lively, they're also loud. Hmm. And for neurodivergent people, they are, they may be overwhelmingly loud. Um, and when you are talking about a new environment, um, particularly with, uh, with neurodivergent folks who have like autism spectrum disorder or something along those lines, first events are overwhelming. So having a quiet room, especially a quiet room where you can have streams of the event available is absolutely it's critical in terms of inclusion, of giving somebody a space to decompress if they feel themselves becoming dysregulated. So emotional dysregulation doesn't happen overnight. Um, are there any? Really, a, a lot of times these kids are excited about the competition, so they're going to be a little, they're going to be a little more dysregulated just because of that. They're in a new place, then you you're you're up in the dysregulation meter a little more. And then you have a very high pitched wailing sound coming from yeah, your remote exactly. control robot and it, it bumps it up to another level. And so you wanna make sure that you have a quiet place for decompression. Um, earplugs and other assistive devices are great. Our, our area supplies earplugs for folks that need them on site. Um, and then this is, a, this is a huge one for me. It's space, space for specialization in FLL. Um, we like to make sure that kids have exposure to and learn every aspect of building the robot and performing the innovation project. That's important. Those are the learning outcomes. That said, particularly with people who have trouble set shifting or who develop hyper-focus based on a, a, a particular interest, they need to be able to have the space and the freedom to delve in as deeply as they want to in that area. While still keeping in mind they have to be, they have to learn proficiencies all over. Um, and then the biggest one for us, because I put it a couple slides back, but I put discovery is secondary to documentation. Discovery is secondary to documentation. The kids aren't going to come home from robot practice and be like, Mom, you won't believe what I just did. I got a piece of paper and a wireframe grid, and I drew the path of the robot from this to the second mission model. And then we talked about what arm it might go. That's not going to be what keeps um, what keeps particularly a neurodivergent kid engaged, right? They're going to be excited about taking a remote control, seeing what sort of arm they needed to do to make the thing go, and then documenting that after the fact. Um, 
So there is so first has been doing a better job of some curricular scaffolding with regard to this and with the innovation project, but they're not necessarily specific to the tasks okay. and specific to what we're looking for in terms of in terms of designing. Um, trying to think of how to say this, designing how we ask our students and how we communicate the tasks to our students. Um, and then and then the other big problem we have is what we're actually trying to do here with documentation is communicate the results of our engineering, right? So with so with that, we're trying, we're having neurodivergent students do something, experience something, but then they have to communicate about it. And particularly when you get kids with expressive, expressive language disorders, that can be extremely difficult. And so you always want, so I actually tend to frame even our engineering notebook documentation and okay, we need to tell people a story about how this happened. So what's what came first? What came second? What came third? And kind of granularly, granularly um, get that story out of them. It I takes a long time. It's really slow. Oh, okay. <clears throat> That we, I think the next person needs oh, to have a check. question in chat. Uh, oh, a question in chat. That's not it. No. Yeah, there's. Posting. That's not a question. Oh, there's a chat. Any accommodations that could, should be requested of first for national implementation? Oh, that's a lot. Okay, this <laughs> is a huge question. Michael, this is an excellent question. Um, I'm sure Ryan is glad you're, you asked this. Um, the best people to reach out to actually are on our thank you page. Um, there's an organization that was started by students at first called Neurodivergent at first. They are absolutely wonderful. If you want any information, if you want any of the technical information we have, this QR code yeah. gets to the GitHub. And all the all the code for the RC stuff is on the GitHub. Yeah. If you want to, if you want to make some RC robots of your own um, to do that kind of development model with FLL, and we'll see you around with whatever questions. But you will have to put, you will have to at least put Hybrix on something for that to work. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, you could still, you could still use a regular Lego software. Just have some dumb mock bots that are running Hybrix and still run the regular software on your spike. But at I least. I used to change the language for Dave. He used to call them dumb bots, and I said they're mock bots. I called them blind bots. They didn't have any like. Blind bots is good too. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I can right. very good. Thank you so much for that. You're so welcome. Okay. Yeah, we were trying to accommodate different yeah. learning styles. It's most amazing thing for her. We were just trying to accommodate different learning styles. A lot of people are more hands on. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. oh, so so we got to do this. Yeah. My mind can be seen. Right. So, yeah, we, we're going to do that. I actually mentioned that. Yeah, uh, somebody in her do, in the yeah, the, the, the innovation project is 